1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, circle action, and being sober-minded, speaking of the um, stampede, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So right here, Peter is saying, this is an end times verse. He's basically fast forwarding to the end of history and goes, hey, put your hope in Jesus because at some point Jesus is going to return at the end of history and is going to make everything right. So trust God during this time. And then he goes on to the next verse. Verse 14, as obedient children then, do not be conformed, circle conformed, to the passions, circle passions, the passions of your former ignorance. So when he's talking about former ignorance, he's saying this, before I knew Jesus, I thought I knew about life. I thought I knew how to serve and make myself happier and do things for myself or whatever. But I was missing the whole point of living. I was ignorant of God. I thought I knew God. I didn't know God until I knew Jesus. And so he's saying, you had passions that before you knew Jesus, your passions led you in ways away from God. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he, God, who called you is holy, circle holy, you also should be holy in all your conduct, circle all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Understand that you've been taught, whether you've absorbed it just by existing, by osmosis in our culture, or you've been taught straight away at our schools, at some churches you've gone to, about the thing I'm going to talk about today. So we started a new series called Lies We Believe, Satan's Greatest Hits. And I'm going to talk about the greatest one today. Everything else I'm going to talk about in this series is built off of this one that I'm talking about. I'm going to do massive heavy lifting for the next few moments because all of us have been taught the thing I'm going to talk about and, we, and most of us believe it. And if there ever was a time when you're going to be like, I can't believe that what I believe was wrong, it's probably going to be this moment. So I've told my staff, this is going to be the series that uh, in the church growth books, they say, don't do that. <laughs> ways, to un ways to ungrow your church. Or how to offend everybody, that's this series. So welcome. <laughs> if you love to be offended, you're going to love this series. Congratulations. Number one is this. If you've got your notes, pull them out. They should be in the uh, bulletin that you got as you walked on campus. If you're watching online, uh, at the top of the Facebook uh, comment section is a link. You can click on that link and my notes will drop, drop down. Number one is this. Life is about me. Hey, life is about me. Isn't that awesome? Well, it's not awesome if you're not me. Look at this. Life is about me. My life is about my goals, my family, and the pursuit of things that make me happy and satisfied. Wow. Praise God, right? Man. Hey, life is about my goals. How many times have you heard that in our culture? Hey, do you have goals? Yeah, man, I, I'm going to do this thing. Do you have friends? Oh, yeah, I got a lot of friends. Do they support you in what you're doing? Yeah, most of them. The other ones that don't, I just unfollow, block. Life is about my, my goals. Life is about my family. I live for my family. I want my family to be happy. I want my kids to be happy. I want my wife to be happy. I want my husband to be happy. As long as they're supporting my goals. Look at this. I design my life around me. And I expect others to support my view of living. Those that don't, I consider enemies of my happiness and fulfillment. Wow, we, live, we literally live in a cancel culture where if you don't say the right thing or do the right thing or hashtag the right thing or whatever, companies run scared because of, of our bully culture that other you know, people go, hey, hashtag you're a hater. And companies are like, oh, don't, don't call us that. We'll change everything. We'll change, you know, the inside of our store or we'll support this cause or we'll make T-shirts or whatever because they don't want to be seen as like small-minded, bigoted haters. And there's a phone call. Jesus is calling right now. Pick it up. <laughs> He's probably saying, listen to what this guy's going to say. Ready? 
I've just described the American culture. Life is about me and my family. And everybody that supports me, I assume is for me and is my friend. People that don't support me, I view as my enemy. And I cut out of my life because I'm unwilling to accept feedback that might go against how I feel about myself. If, you're an, if you, you are my enemy if you don't support the way I view life. The things that bring me happiness are a right of my humanity and no one can take it from me. Hey, I have a right to happiness and no one can take my humanity away from me and my humanity equates my happiness. And here's our first principle, ready? The reason I live is for me. You want to know the reason I live? is for my happiness. The things that make me happy are the reason I exist. And the things that don't make me happy, I try to get out of my life. And that includes people. Number one, life is about me. The reason I live is for me. If you got your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes 2. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament, kind of in the middle, middle of your Bible. Ecclesiastes 2, and I want you to know something about this passage. This was written by a man named Solomon. He's the son of David. David is the king of Israel. David wrote the majority of your, the Psalms in the middle of your Bible, those Psalms in there. Many of them were written by King David. His son is Solomon. Solomon wrote a lot of your Proverbs, the wisdom literature in your Bible. So it's that guy who's speaking here in Ecclesiastes 2, we're going to start in verse 8, Ecclesiastes 2, 8. So now he's the king. He's basically a dictator if he wants to be. He's the king. He has everything he needs, everything he wants. He chases down all the pleasures of his heart. And let's see what Solomon has to say. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, which are the delight of the sons of men. Ready? I just literally described to you masculinity. What do men want? A lot of money. What do men want? A lot of power. What do men want? Have a lot of sex. That's literally the trinity of masculinity. Women, not too much of those three things. <laughs> Women care. Women generally are more like relational. High value for relationships. Men are more high occupational. What can I make? What can I build? What can I build for myself and put my name on that building? I'm going to name this city after myself. Jacksonville. <laughs> Tends to be how men are wired. Guess what? Solomon's already lived your life, son. You think, man, if I could just get more Instagram followers, man, if I could just be more popular, man, if I could just make more money, man, if I could just have more sex, it'll be amazing. Well, guess what? Solomon thought that too. He ran down your road at an extreme level. He ran down a road you'll never get to. You'll never be a big boy like Samson. Or Samson. Samson either. But Solomon. <laughs> you have to be buff like Samson. Ready? Look at this. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. So God has given him popularity. I'm preaching on a guy that's 3,000 years old, and I'm talking about this guy. There's not even pharaohs and other great leaders of history that get talked about in the modern day like I'm talking about Solomon. So let me help you. Ready? Solomon had so much gold and so much silver, they almost couldn't store it all. It said that silver was like, like stones on the ground while Solomon was king. Like it was just, it was almost worthless. There was so much of it. Solomon had, ready, look, he had 300 wives so these are, guy, these are guys, these are women that he married as official wives. So if he's the king, many times he would make um, arrangements with other kingdoms and marry their daughter so they would be at peace because it's rare that a king would go against his own daughter and family, grandchildren. So he would marry other king's daughters, princesses. He's, he has 300 wives, official wives. Watch this. If you think that's a train wreck of a family nightmare... He has 700 concubines. So concubines are like second-class wives. So they're still wives. They're still official women that are married to the king, but they're not official wives as far as lineage goes. 
So watch. Solomon had a thousand women that was officially part of his life. So if you were super wealthy, you could support multiple families. So imagine supporting a thousand family households. That's how wealthy Sam, uh, Solomon was. So understand, in, a, in the real world, Solomon could have literally slept with one woman every day and over three years never slept with the same woman again. And he still would have stayed within the, the women he was married to. That's the kind of crazy happiness that Solomon went after. Now what does he say? Because that's, that's us at a smaller level. Look what he says. So I became great. I, I had all the Instagram followers on Instagram. And I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. I was greater than even my father, David. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. In other words, he got pleasure from his work that he did as a king, things he projects he did. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had done expending in doing it. And behold, all was what? Vanity and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Let me help you. Ready? Our culture teaches you life is about you. You want to be happy? I'd love to be happy. Then continually search after things that make you happy in the moment. We have a culture that teaches you be addicted to euphoria. Euphoria is the idea of like, gosh, today's a great day. Isn't today a great day? It's amazing. I just feel so good today. I woke up and it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. I looked at myself in the mirror. I go, you're amazing. I didn't even need to do my hair. I like woke up like a movie star with like makeup already done, hair already done. I just walked right out of my house. Everybody, my neighbors were like lined up on the driveway going, you look great. I'm going to mow your lawn while you're gone. And I got in my car, and it, the car was like, the little computer said, welcome back, Mr. Jackson. I missed you while you were sleeping, while I was in the garage. I'm so glad you're here. Like, everybody's encouraging me. It's amazing. What a great day. I feel great. I've had 14 Red Bulls before breakfast. It's amazing. <laughs> Our culture teaches you be addicted to euphoria, which is the feeling of like, Ah, I'm happy. Here's the problem with that, is you can't stay there and it doesn't last long. And the things you chase for the feelings of euphoria at the end will destroy you. Ready? Look at me. The end of chasing happiness is emptiness. This is going to wreck your shop because you haven't been taught that your whole life. You've been taught what you feel good in the moment is right for you. So go chase that thing. Ready? The end of chasing happiness is emptiness. The guy who had more than you will ever have says, I got to the end of my life, and it was literally like chasing the wind. And that's going to hurt some of your feelers because literally some of you guys wonder, why do I have everything and I feel like garbage? Why do I have everything a person could want and I totally feel empty? Why is that? I can tell you why. Because anytime you chase something that's not, ha, have, have an end as God, it's empty. It'll feel good in the moment. It serves you emptiness at the end. That's the problem with chasing happiness as an end goal. There's nothing wrong with being happy, but here's my point. When you chase happiness as the reason you live, you will always be empty. But our culture says this, number one, life is about me. Which leads us to number two, God wants me to be happy. <laughs> you know what's awesome? Not only do I love myself, but God loves me as much as I love myself, which is a whole lot. <laughs> so I'm going to fix something in your mind, ready? Because you've heard this, right? At this church and even other churches you've been to maybe, God loves you. Is that true? Absolutely true. God has an unending, undying love for you. There is no day God doesn't love you. 
There's no wickedness that you've done that God can't forgive because God loves you. That is true. That's the foundation of the gospel, which is God loves people. Wicked, lost people like me and you. He loves us. Here's the key, though. Our culture takes a truism, which is God loves us, and extrapolates this. Because God loves me, he wants me to be happy. And that is, the, that is a fatal error. Just because God, watch me, watch. Just because God loves you doesn't mean you won't have difficulty. Just because God loves you doesn't mean that you won't have depressing days. Just because God loves you doesn't mean you'll live in euphoria your whole life. Watch. If you chase happiness, you will end up with emptiness. But we've been taught life is about me. And actually, even in some churches, you, they'll teach you, God wants you to be happy. Look at this. No one can love or understand me better than myself. So I trust myself to know what is best and what can bring me the greatest happiness. Because God loves me, he wants me to be happy as well. My drive for happiness is supported by God. And whatever doesn't, I assume, isn't from God. I literally just described to you every self-help, self-help book you've ever read. I've literally described every meme that you've ever shared on the internet that talked about just believe in yourself. I've literally described to you every Oprah interview you've ever heard. Every Dr. Phil thing you've ever talked about. Here's how to get over mental health issues. It's some combination of you need some drugs or you need some counseling. And usually that counseling is you focused. Why aren't you happy? Ah, I just got some problems in my life. Well, you need to remove those negative things out of your life. Literally, that's everything you've ever been taught, and me too. I remember sitting in my high school classroom. The the way they taught us to have uh, our identity, there was a class called I Can. I don't remember if any of you guys saw Zig Ziglar. He was a big uh, motivational speaker, and it got into the public education system. And what his program was, I can. Look at this, I even did this. (laughs) And you know, the whole foundation of that was kind of, it's the stereotype of you're good enough, you're smart enough, you can do it. Which some of that is true. It's good to have a value for yourself like, hey, there's things I can do that I haven't done yet. I need to have some self-confidence. And that's okay. But the problem was the end result of that was just keep chasing more. Just, you can do it. Okay, have I done it? No. Okay. Am I here now? No, not yet. Are we here yet? No, still get more. Okay. I'm keeping on believing in me, and I'm still not really happy because I feel like crap. Why is that? Ready? You're not built to chase stuff. You're built to chase your Savior. Ready? Here we go. Number one, life is about me. Number two, even God wants me to be happy. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is the largest church in America, the largest Christian church in America, and this is what came off their stage a while back. So I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Let's open our heart to him today. I just want you to know what you just heard is satanic. And that came off the largest church in America. So I want you to understand that I don't know anything about Victoria Osteen. Number one, I don't know why he's letting his wife preach. But number two, uh, I want you to understand that that was absolutely satanic. That's not in Scripture. It's not found anywhere, anywhere in the Bible at all, that you should live your life for yourself and that God's greatest priority is your happiness. Actually, it trains people that if I don't feel happiness, then God must not be in my life or God doesn't love me. Rather than saying, God has a goal for difficulty in my life. 
If I chase happiness, I'm always going to wonder, does God love me because I don't feel happy all the time? I feel lonely. I feel empty. I feel lost. I feel broken. I feel like I'd rather be dead today. And you know what that comes from? That comes from having your eyes on the wrong thing. If you feel worthless, it's because your identity is in the wrong thing. What's Jesus in number three? Life is about God. Life is about God. I hope I've dug far enough into your soul with the stuff you've been taught for you to realize literally that's what I've thought my whole life was life is about me and my family and our happiness. And you know what? As parents, everybody pay attention. Everybody look at me. I'm going to wreck your shop even more. If you're offended, it's going to get worse. Ready? Here we go. Look at me. I'm going to, I'm going to rewind American history real quick. Right here we go. Pilgrims on a boat. They land here trying to escape religious persecution, and they, want to, they don't want the state church of, of Europe. They want to worship God the way they want to. Okay, they land. The pilgrims land here. They meet the Native Americans. They have Thanksgiving. That's what we celebrate every year. Okay, it's that time frame of history. Okay, the pilgrims' idea was let's serve, let's be free to serve God how we want to and serve people. That's their idea. Serve God, serve people. That was the original idea. We get here, we're free to do that. Over time, colonies set up. And then it's manifest destiny, which means everybody keep pushing west so we can create a country. Okay? So now we've gone from originally, hey, let's serve God and let's serve people, to now we got a country, let's serve our country. So we, we care about our borders. We care about America. We care about the United States. That's, that's what we've built is our, is our country. So now it's like serve country and not really others and maybe not even God. So now we get to World War I and then we get to World War, World War I, which was horrendous. We get to World War II, which was also horrible. At the end of World War II, I'm going to show you something. We have this weird turn that happened in America, in the psyche of Americans, where they were like, they wanted to build something great. They wanted to do something better. It was, it, was, it was the time of explosion of like happiness and driving for, for get the, it's what we call the American dream. Have your house and your car and your 2.5 kids and you get to live on a little street, which is different than almost every other place in the world. God has blessed our, 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 our nation with the ability to do that for the most part. It's crazy how free we are and the abilities we have to, to chase wealth and do those things. But that came out of like basically post-World War II. All of a sudden, it's like it's starting to turn inward. I want to serve myself. I want to serve my family. You know what my highest values are? is me and my family in our little nuclear home. And you know what the end result now has been over the last 20 years? How we as parents have raised our kids, which is I want to be my kid's best friend. I don't want to have to be their parent. Because if I have to be their parent, there are going to be days they don't like me. And I'm so insecure, I can't handle my kids not liking me. So I raise my kids with my highest value as a parent is, I want my kid to be happy. So I give them everything. And my kid's still a tool. <laughs> and I can't figure out why. I give you everything, sweetie. And you still treat me like trash. And you still talk to me like garbage. And you don't want to go to church? Okay, sweetie, I'll just tuck you in. And just... <laughs> you don't have to do anything with the family, sweetie. You just be about yourself. You be on the internet when we're at, when we're at dinner. You just do whatever you want. You stay in your own little insulated world. And I'll just make sure you're happy, little Johnny. Did I offend every family in here? Good. Because literally that's how we've taught our kids. That didn't start back here. It ended here though, which is we are, we are relentlessly focused on our kids' happiness. And you know what that's produced in our kids? Is focus on me. Everything's about me. If I'm not happy, I'm going to tell everybody else about it. I'm going to make my parents' life hell. I'm going I'm to get on my teachers because they did something wrong by giving me a bad grade. If you've ever been a teacher... God bless you. <laughs> it's like, I need to speak to Mr. Uh, Robinson. No, right now. That was back when you could meet with a teacher. Before COVID. Hey, Sally, my daughter, failed your algebra test. And I need you to let her retake it. Why? There's no reason that my daughter should have to take a, a test on the day that you choose. She should be able to like choose the day that she's ready 
And plus, the day that she took the test, she was really stoned. And she, was, she couldn't think right. So now that she's sober, I expect you to let my daughter retake this algebra test now that she has a clear mind. We have parents telling teachers what they should be teaching. We have kids telling the, the professors what they want to learn. Listen to me. This is the culture we live in. And you know what the end of, the end of this culture is? Is emptiness. Because there is no teacher that's going to make you happy. There is no pastor that's going to make you happy. There's no parents that are going to make you happy. There's no president that's going to make you happy. Nobody in your life is going to make you happy and euphoric every day. Not even God. Why? Because of number three, life is about God. As creator, not only does life not exist without him, but living will be done wrong without him. The original lie from Satan in the Garden of Eden, which is in the book of Genesis in your Bible, was to believe that God was holding back good from Eve, our first mother, and that she could trust herself. Ready? Here's our, here's our principle. The best lies are the ones that sound true and that we want to believe. Listen to me. I'm going I'm to tell, tell you how you'll believe anything. I'm going to give you the anatomy of a lie. Here's what a lie looks like. Here's the anatomy of its, of its structure. It's only two pieces. It's super simple. The first part of a lie is this. It sounds good. It doesn't sound untrue. It sounds like that's, that's plausible. The first part is, the first gate of your, of your belief door is, does it sound true? Does it, does, it, does it not sound untrue? And then if you go, I think that could be real. That could be true. The door is open. And it starts. But the next one is the killer. The next one goes all the way into your heart. There's only two doors to your heart. One is, that sounds like it might be true. You know what the second one is? I want that to be true. I want it to be true that God only cares about me and my happiness. I want that to be true. Because one, it sounds true. When that came off the stage, everybody, in the, you know, the people in the church were like, sounds good to me. Worship isn't about God, it's about me. Life is about me, and it's a total lie. Look at this. The strength of lies during temptation is immediate self-gratification rather than considering the long-term consequences. Ready? God knows what's best for our lives, and living this life is a test to see if we put our faith in him or in our feelings. Here's our principle. Our life isn't about our good, but about our God. Let me give you a new reason to live when you want to die and you feel depressed and you feel lonely and you feel lost. Ready? Your eyes are on the wrong place. The more you look inward, the more you're self-focused, the emptier you will feel. When you get your eyes off yourself and go, what does God want for my life? You will have meaning and purpose and joy that goes beyond the euphorias of the up and downs of your life. This is literally a new way to live. This is lit I'm literally giving you a new way to run your home, a new way to parent, a new way to do everything right now. And it's, it's almost polar opposite of everything you've ever been taught. But it's scriptural. Life is about God. He's our creator. We didn't make ourselves. Life is about serving him and letting him bless us. That way, when we go through difficult times, we know that God is still with us. It's amazing, like, when you wake up during the day and you go, today's just going to be garbage. And you roll over and look at the clock, and it's oh dark 30, and you've got to get on the 15 and go to Orange County, and you're like, Jesus in heaven help. And you roll out of bed, and the floor is cold, and the dog puked. <laughs> and your wife, you know, still isn't up, and she's like, you just deal with it. Oh, crap. And you get up and Scrub the carpet, and now you're late, and you got to get in your carpool, and you're like, this day's going to be garbage. Ready? Listen to me. That day might be tomorrow. That day might have been this morning when you got in a fight with your wife and your, and your 2.5 kids in the van on the way to the orchard. I don't know when, but here's what I can tell you. God will take you through your difficulty if you're focused on him. Look at me. Ready? Temptation in our life says this, God wants me to be happy. I'm not happy now. Is God even in my life? 
Scripture says this, if you focus on him, God is always in your life. God is always working through difficulty. You got a difficult marriage? Yep, God is with you. You got a difficult parenting situation? Yep, totally hard. God is with you. You got a difficult job situation? Yep, God is with you. You got a cat in the house? Kick it out. That's wisdom. (laughs) Okay? You're getting all kinds of offense today. Look at this. Many times, lies come as things that you want to be true. I'll give you an example. You're a wife that's like, my marriage is in a rough spot. We don't talk anymore. I'm unhappy. I know he's unhappy. I think I should just bail. So you go to the gym where you always go, and you just happen to be on the treadmill next to Johnny Hot Pants. <laughs> and you're running on the treadmill, and he strikes up a conversation. And you find out, man, he's really he's nice, he's good looking, and he has a boat. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. And you realize the more you're talking to him, you're like, you know what? I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be happy. Why should I be in some marriage that's like, I have a dud at home for a husband, but I got Johnny Hot Pants with a boat? <laughs> like, why don't I be happy? And then you text your girlfriends, oh my God, OMG, I wish I wasn't married because, oh, there's this guy right next to me running on the treadmill, and uh, it's just so amazing. And you know what your girlfriends all text back to you? Oh, girl, go for it. You deserve to be happy. Oh, girl, get on with your life. <laughs> Smiley face. Literally, that's, that's what our culture teaches us. I want all the people around me to support what I'm about ready to do so I feel good about doing it. Rather than saying, what does God want? Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to marry Johnny Hot Pants and... Well, Grandma, way to go. That's the way. <laughs> hey, you know what? When you get married to him, here's the thing. Temptation doesn't come with a list that goes, hey, if you wreck your marriage, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to get a divorce and all, all the things that you just talked about at the gym are going to come vomiting out into public. So you're going to have public shame. Okay. Whether you like it or not, it's coming. Um, you're going to have to split the house 50, 50. So you're gonna have to move out of the house you love. And, um, depending on how the market is, you may actually lose money. So you're going to owe money to the bank. Okay. And also, um, all the girlfriends that said, that's a great idea. They are going to go about their lives and it doesn't affect them at all. So everybody that told you, hey, that's a really good idea, it doesn't affect them. They're going to go on with their life and leave you with the the, the tragedy that you're going through right now. Um, Your kids are going to have to go back and forth to two different houses every weekend, um, and that's going to screw them up, okay? Um, uh, You're going to go to church, and people are going to have to hear about it, that you're sleeping with somebody that's not your husband, and you you work here at the church, and a pastor like me is going to have to say it's an unacceptable way to live, and you're going to lose the one thing you love in life, which is serving God at a church because you're unwilling to leave your life a sin. And so, uh, you know what's interesting about temptation? Temptation goes, don't worry about all that stuff. Come on. You deserve to be happy. Get euphoria. Let's get stoned. (laughs) Rather than going, hey, you know what? You could go do that, but here's what it's going to cost you. Here's the bill on the front end. You know why temptation works? It's because the bill's hidden from you. It's going to be great. You deserve to be happy. It's a literal lie from hell. So what do we do? I'm going to show you a new way. Lastly, number three. Number one, life is about me. Number two, God wants me to be happy. Number three, actually life is about God. And number four, then what if, if, if I'm not going to be living to be happy, then what am I living for? Number four, God's highest value is my holiness. Let me help you. I'm going to give you a whole new way to live your life right now. And this is super new for some of you, for almost all of us. So let me walk the path with you. God's goal for my life is my holiness. I just read it out of 1 Peter. Be holy because God is holy. What does that look like? I can't be holy. I'm not a saint. I sin. I'm not like God. Okay. But the process of being like Jesus, like God, Is God oftentimes, you know when when God molds our character the most? Not when I'm living in pleasure. You know when God molds my character the most? Is when the business isn't going good. When COVID goes around the world and I got to navigate difficulty. When my wife wants to leave me and I got to go, man, I got to change as a man and get my act together and start loving my home. When my kids 
are going off the rails and I, I, I struggle with like, man, I really want to be their friend. I really want to love them, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like I got to put my foot down and like get, get control of my house again. That's in those moments, because you've been taught life is about being happy. I, I don't feel happiness in all these stressful moments. So you know what I do? I run from them. Because life is about my happiness. I divorce. I let my kids just do whatever they want. I, it's always somebody else's fault. You know why my life is bad? It's because you're in it. So I unfollow you and block you. Like we live in such a narcissistic culture, which is me focused, that we don't ever learn that life is about being more like Jesus. And God lets me have pleasure. Look at this. Watch. I'm going I'm to help you. The path to holiness has both things in it. Look at me. It has pleasure and it also has pain. Do you know why you have pleasure in your life? It's because God lets you have it. I don't know if you guys saw the, the sunset that happened a couple days ago here in Temecula. I was, like, I was looking at that and I go, God, thank you that you painted that thing in the sky so that I could appreciate the beauty that you built in the world. And you know what? I got up the other day and it was a freezing 62 in my house. And I got in my car and turned the seat warmers on and my butt got warm. And I said, God, thank you for this beautiful car that's warming my butt. <laughs> so here's my point. Is God pro-pleasure? Absolutely. Part of the blessings of God is he gives you pleasure in life. Good relationships. You made a lot of money. Awesome. Do something good with it. You see art. You see sunsets. You're like, this is beautiful. You get to sing. Listen, there's so much pleasure in life, but I want, you, I want you to disabuse your mind of this idea that somehow pleasure is from a different place than God. So watch. When you have pleasure, say, thank you, God, for this moment. When you get to have sex with your spouse, go, thank you, Jesus. Depending on when. But at some point, go, thank you, Jesus. When you make a lot of money, thank you, God. When the 15 doesn't have any traffic, which is like 3 in the morning, go, thank you, Jesus. The point, the point I'm making to you is this. On the path to holiness, there's a bunch of pleasure. But it's all from God. And here's the thing. On the path to holiness, there's a bunch of pain. And it's from God. Why? Because God wants my character to change. And my character changes most when I'm, when I'm challenged. You know how I become more of a man of God? I'm going to tell you right now. It's being married. You want to know why that is? Because nothing challenges your selfishness more than a spouse. You know how I become less selfish? Is when I have to know, regardless of how I feel, serve my wife. Regardless of how I feel, serve my family. Regardless of how I feel, serve this church, the thousands of people that come here. Relentlessly serve the people that come here. You know how I, how I become more godly? Is when people backstab me and talk smack about me behind my back and gossip about me in the, in the community. And I still have to love them and still have to serve them. When I want to just go, no. <laughs> you, know, you know how I become godly? I don't become godly primarily through pleasure. I become godly through pain. God doesn't hate me in my pain. God helps me through my pain. God helps me to not get divorced. God helps me to parent my child. God helps me to love my community. When I don't feel euphoria, I know God is working in my life for good. That's what holiness is. Become more like Jesus. How do I become more like Jesus? Oftentimes it's through difficulty. Ready? Accept the pleasure as from God. Say, thank you, God, for this pleasurable moment. Always thank God for pleasure. Pleasure is not bad. Pleasure is awesome. But that's not the reason we live. When you pursue pleasure, it's empty. When you pursue holiness, you get pleasure and you understand pain. Pain isn't anti-God. Pain isn't God hating you. Pain is God saying, let's work in your character to make you a man or woman of God that you're not right now. And here's our last principle. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. Listen to me, and I'm done. What I just described to you right now will save your marriage. Love your spouse. If they've sinned against you, forgive them. 
Serve your, serve your wife, husbands. Love your wives. Don't flirt even in your mind. Be disciplined. Be disciplined to be holy. Be a man of God. I know it's hard, but you can do it with God's help. Wives, love your husbands. Ladies, love the men in your life. Care about them. Respect them. I know it's hard. I know he's a total lame-o sometimes. I know. But Jesus is working in you. Don't give up. Another guy will just be the same problems with a different face. Work on what you've got for the glory of God. And you'll be amazed how God does great things in your life.